Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. If you are trying to evaluate whether real estate is the right career for you, wondering whether you are doing the right things to launch into quick success, or looking for tips and tools you can use today to become a more productive agent, this is your podcast. Welcome to So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. This is episode four, Learning from Legends. And we have the fabulous Leanne Carswell with us today. Leanne is a real estate broker and owner and leader of Expert Real Estate Team serving upstate South Carolina. And Leanne has a lot of insights to share with us today. We're going to hear about what brought her to real estate about her team, how she's built a team, and how she runs her business. So you are going to get some good nuggets of insight and inspiration from Leanne today. Leanne, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, We are thrilled to have you here. We are so thrilled. So love South Carolina. For those who haven't been there, it is a beautiful part of the country. Are you from South Carolina originally? I am. You are? Okay. So you're a a local girl done good down there. Yeah. Love that. Love that. All right. So let's hear about you. What made you decide real estate was the career for you? I got married when I was 21 and moved to Florida and <clears throat> got down there, didn't know anybody. So I ended up getting a job with a company called Kessel Real Estate. And at that time, I didn't know anything, but Long story short, I got divorced, moved home three years later, and I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I knew I had seen Kirk Kessel, who's in the um, Tom Ferry ecosystem, um, seen how his team was set up and, you know, he had certain people doing certain things and I had done it for the last three years. So I was really good at it. I saw the agents that worked for Kirk um, making you know, a lot of money at that time. This was 95 to 98. Um, So when I came home, I just decided, you know, I'm going to do it. Um, So I I came back to South Carolina and um, went out and talked to another um, agent who had been in the Tom Ferry ecosystem. He had gone out and started his own coaching company and I went into him and I said, I want to be an agent. And he said, well, let me think about it. Well, I went over to the next brokerage and said, I want to be an agent. And they said, come on over. Oh, wow. so that agent later called me back and said, okay, we will take you. And I'm like, no, nah, I've already moved on. Right. So that was 27 years ago. Um, and Fast forward, I went to Keller Williams for several years. And then back in 2011, I went out on my own because I was tired of paying the franchise fees mm-hmm. and um, just do it myself. Wow. Well, wow. so let me take you back to that early um, beginning in real estate when you were observing the other agents doing well and thinking like, this could be something that I could do. What was it, if you can kind of imagine yourself back then, that made you feel like this is the right thing for me? Was there anything that either spoke to you or that you're like, yep, I have this in me that, you know, anyone listening who might be kind of wondering whether real estate is the right career for them could think about in themselves? I was still so green. I just didn't have a clue. Um, I just had seen the back end of it and knew soup to nuts what needed to be done um having worked on it so I had a huge leg up um than just your average person getting into real estate um but one thing that when I was 24 when I came back home um newly divorced broke I mean I was living with mom and dad totally broke and um it was probably it was right after I moved back home I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis Oh and um, I didn't know what that was. I mean, this was, you know, 98. So mm-hmm. it's kind of before the internet or as the internet was getting started. So right. I, you know, looked it up and I cried for a little bit. And then I thought, I, I've got to su- provide for myself. I've got to make hay while the sun's shining. And I just haven't looked back. 
So, wow. So you have, it sounds like a, a tenacity and a level of confidence that, you know, you were, you were going to do this. You were going to get in and, and make it happen. That's, that's fantastic. So now we're at, you're in South Carolina, you've started to work as a real estate agent. What were the first few things would you say that gave you a taste of success? Do you remember whether you, was there anything you learned? Was it working with a particular person, working with a buyer or seller? Was it really just like getting in there and doing the work? Just getting in there and doing the work. And back in the day, and I still kind of keep them, but we had yellow cards that <laughs> I, it was, it's like LP Mama, the whole yeah. Zillow LP Mama. Um, I used my yellow cards and naively, I tried to work every yellow card as if they were going to buy from me. Hmm. Now, I worked myself to death in those first two years after I got back because at that time I had sworn off men um, because, you know, I'd just gotten divorced. So I (laughs) I had sworn off men. I just worked 24 seven because I was broke and I had I had to work. Yeah. Um, That was my my biggest. I just didn't have anything else to do. I just worked. Okay. Okay. And you had a, you had a why you had a drive. You were going to make this, make it possible for you to provide for yourself. Absolutely. I want to talk about that, that yellow card system, because I'm guessing a lot of our listeners don't really know what that is. Explain the yellow card. My yellow card, it's got everything on there that when a buyer called and I would still use it today if I, you know, rather than being sticky note queen, I was the sticky note queen for a while, but um, to have a stack of these and it's got in there the things that you need to know, their name, their address, phone numbers, email addresses. Do they have an agent? Do they have to sell to buy? Do they own a rent? You know, and then the rest of it's just where I can make notes. And then did I put them in my CRM? Where did it come from? I know you can't see that. And then what date it was, but... Like I say, there was a lot of, back then I didn't have any, I was working. I mean, they were buying from me or a lot of them, you know, we know now that you, not all buyers buy from us, right. but I just didn't have any other thoughts. I mean, I just thought they were all going to buy from me. Yeah. And I think that probably the fact that you approached it like that created a lot of opportunity for you. I mean, ha- going into it with the mindset of, these people are going to be my buyers. They're going to work with me. Probably gave you the the mental freedom and capacity to keep following up with them in a way that maybe some agents wouldn't. And what did you say? Like that's a big piece that I imagine you probably take to your team that you've got to approach this as opportunity every time, and you've got to believe what you're you know kind of selling to other people or the opportunity that you're presenting to other people. If you believe you're not going to, what's that old expression? Whether you think you can or you think you can't. You're right. Right. It's kind of that that same piece. So you thought you could, and you did. There was no other choice. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you mentioned CRM. Were you using a CRM way back in the early in the, the 90s? I have had top producer ever since I can remember. So back mm-hmm. in t- probably 2000, 98, 2000, I had gotten top producer. I still use Top Producer 8i because I've just been used to it. Yeah. Now, it is clunky. I use it because it's got a great male um, piece to it. Mm-hmm. I also have another CRM that we use that's more slick and um, you can text from it and things like mm-hmm. that. So Top Producer is kind of like it houses all of our past clients and you know it's it's got all that in it but all the current clients that we're loving on and nurturing you know they start somewhere else they end up in top producer okay okay yeah and so for those who don't know a CRM is a contact relationship management system and looking at those yellow cards I remember hearing a story years ago that it was Gary Keller maybe when he started he used just like a, an index card, like a Rolodex kind of a system or in like one of those little recipe box looking things. And he would just move, like he'd put one in and then he'd move it to the back and then he'd mm-hmm. like rotate through and he would just call, call, call. And that was his system. And he used to always say, what's the best technology? It's the technology that you're going to use, whether it is a, an index card, a yellow card or a slick and fancy CRM. 
you've got to use something that's going to keep those clients in front of you so that you can stay in front of them. And it's, it's great that you figured that out so quickly in your career. That's something I think a lot of people kind of fumble with or struggle with, um, you know, to, to stay on track with mm-hmm. that. So that, that's cool. All right. That's, that's a key piece for those people listening that CRM and keeping in front of your clients. All right. So now you, you fast forwarded, you're through Keller Williams, you've decided you're going to go out on your own. Talk us through what that process looked like for you. Oh God. Well, my husband, my new husband who I met, he was a buyer of mine within two years after I had moved back home. He was one of my buyers and he had like, no, but sport off men want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And now he's one of my buyers and I don't know. I thought he was cute and we started dating. And, <laughs> but he saw how, and, and actually just from investing, I could go off on another tangent on that because he um, came to me because we had already bought one property. I'd helped him buy one property. And um, he came to me and said, you know, for this next property, why don't you go in on it with me? You know, he couldn't afford it all by himself. Mm. I'm sitting there thinking I'm 24, 25. Um, you know, I don't have much. And I got my mom and dad to go in with me and we made a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And since then we've done it again and again. He was my catalyst at Leanne, look at the numbers Mm -hmm. because, you know, what is this current company bringing to the table? Mm -hmm. You know, you can take what you're paying that current company and go do it on your own and not have to, you know, live by their rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that meant get your broker's license. Yep. And operate under your own flag. Mm -hmm. So that is a daunting thing for a lot of agents out there. And so you said that was the catalyst, him kind of opening your eyes up to the financial possibility. What else do you feel like you needed to like have in place in order to do that? If there's an agent who's like, oh, maybe that, maybe I should go indie, as we call it, go out and do your own thing. What should an agent be thinking about other than the, that, financial piece of it well I mean at that point I was a satellite office for Keller Williams I already had my own office which we owned um really all I had to do to switch was go to broker school which was just so boring (laughs) um and um then change out the signs and the big thing I didn't want to do was have a uh, trust account because I knew in our area anyway, a lot of realtors, that's why they lost their real estate license because of trust accounts and holding other people's money. And at that yeah. time, one coach told me, he said, well, you don't have to have a trust account. And I'm like, you don't. And so I don't have a trust account. I let the attorneys hold the trust or the other realtors. And um, so you know, I think it was probably a different situation than a lot of agents may have, but it, um, and just having the experience behind that to go out and be able to, you know, answer my other agents and my team, their questions and being confident about that. Yeah. Yeah. Having that foundation behind you was was certainly key, I think. All right. So let's talk about the team now. Tell me about your team. What is your team structure? Are you buyers agents, listing agents? How does it look? Well, we, for a long time, um, I did all the listings. Um, I mean, they could bring do listings, but it wasn't something I was training them to do. And then I heard something through Tom Ferry one time, maybe five or seven years ago, that 69% of all buyers are sellers. And I'm like, they're not giving me that many leads. I mean, they were should have been saying, here, Leanne, here's you a seller, go out and sell them a house so I can, you know, or sell their house so I can, you know, sell them a house, a new right. buy. Yeah. And I just wasn't getting that. And I'm like, okay, I just failed to teach them how to do that. Mm. Um, so since then we have now, we've got about 20 agents. Um, they can all, you know, list and sell. Now, I won't give them any of my leads to go list unless I, they've gone through a training process that mm-hmm. um, we set up. It's a 13 week, pretty intensive training that where they have to role play with me. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's this and, and I've had several of them drop out because they just couldn't take it. Um, 
And I feel bad, but then several of them I'm like, no, you need to stay in and have been become great listing agents. Um, but it's um, but now we've got um five staff members. So um uh, Peggy, my listing coordinator, if everybody were to quit, I would I would want to keep Peggy. She's my my right hand girl. She's licensed. Um, she started out as an assistant and now she does all of my listing stuff. Um, we've got a closing coordinator, uh, of course, the receptionist, marketing coordinator, and my assistant just quit to go be a chef. So I've got to hire another assistant. Wow. Okay. Sounds like a really good infrastructure. Let me ask you about, I want to dig into this, this listing training that you do. Can any agent qualify for that? Or do you look for certain agents? Because, you know, you hear... For those who are, are thinking about what they want to do in terms of like listing versus buying, you always hear for the disc analysis that a high D or a higher D, which is the dominance aspect of the disc analysis, is usually more suited for listing. So do you evaluate your agents or do you all let them kind of give it a shot? I evaluate them all just so I know how to best talk to them. Um I prefer that if they go through the training, um, you know, that they've got at least a year's experience just mm -hmm. getting their feet wet because mm -hmm. it's just easier to, you know, do the 13 week training. Yeah. But no, because, you know, everybody has their tribe. Everybody, you know, fits with somebody. And then we if if we as the team give them a lead, then. And we're constantly following up and just making sure they're doing their follow-ups mm -hmm. with it. But um, no, no, I never and haven't. It's probably a good idea to do the disc for and, you know, just say, hey, only D's are doing it. Well, maybe not. I mean, if you're finding people that are varying, you know, disc profiles succeeding, maybe that would have been a more of a prohibitive piece than anything. I, yeah. I like your approach to it. That's a, that's a, a great system. I love the 13 week piece. I love the after one full year in the business piece. Give us a little overview of what that training looks like. Oh, God, um, it starts out and, and it has to be. Oh, I had a here we go. Week one um, is to get them a copy of my listing presentation. Um mm -hmm. And it's a video of me and Peggy, my listing coordinator. I'm doing a listing presentation for her and we record it and give it to them to, you know, play over and over and over. And they tell me, oh, I played that thing 15 times. Mm -hmm. um, so the next week, then they're supposed to be practicing. And, you know, if there's a bunch of them, we need to get them into groups so they can, you know, role play and practice. Mm -hmm. Um then we break up in week three and say, get one on one with each agent. I don't do it in groups anymore, but um, get one on one with each agent and let them do a front end for me. Mm -hmm. So just the the presentation part mm -hmm. um, and see how that goes. And if they make it through that, then they get to practice some more and they come back and do the pricing part where they're going over the comps. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them, you know, we've had to send back to the drawing board to tweak that because it's just not, it doesn't flow and it's mm -hmm. just real jinky and mm -hmm. doesn't flow. So um, eventually it'll get to a point where they take a new, new one soup to nuts and we'll give them actually appointments that I've been on that have not listed yet. So, and it'll be, you know, something that I might have come up with a price on. And so when they do the pricing, I can look at it and go, yeah, you hit the nail on the head or boy, you really missed that one. <laughs> right. So just to make sure, you know, how, see how their comps are going. Um, but it's just a week on and week off type thing. And then mm -hmm. as the, we get down to the last few weeks, it's more of the in our office um, checklist. Here's how we do it. Once you get the listing paperwork, you know, there's another video of Leanne doing the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And here's what I say when I talk about um, the listing contract. So I've got one um, agent that's going through it right now. He is a um, C. He is a total mm -hmm. 
you know, analytical C mm-hmm. and he gets on the listing paperwork and scares you to death and goes over everything. And I'm just like, be quiet, no. stop talking, just <laughs> give them the, you know, just move on. Right. So, and I'll, you know, afterwards I'll give them the good and the bad, what they did and just say, you know, you, and, and I'll even drama it up, you know, as he's doing it for us, I'll sit there and go, <laughs> oh, you know, and just, yeah, I mean, just ham it up a little bit. And cause I'm sitting there wishing he, this would be over with. <laughs> um, so, and just trying to teach him how to read people. Yes. So, love that. Anyway. yeah. But it just kind of goes along and then, you know, they end up passing if, you know, they passed each stage. And so you fought the end. Nice. I love it. That's a great program. And it sounds like it has all the the essential pieces that are are necessary. Love it. Love it. And then for the team that, you know, you're you're growing or building, do you have like your site set on bringing more agents on or what's what's kind of next for you? Yes, that is. um uh, the agents that I've got, they're all great agents. They are swamped. Um, you know, I, I need, and I has, had to ask my marketing guy, I'm like, slow down mm. on getting us any more leads coming in because they can't keep up with the way the market is right now. And, you know, I just hate to have money blown by the wayside. So we're starting on a big recruiting kick. So mm. Fantastic. Well, that's an awesome problem that you have too many leads coming in. That's, that's fantastic. Um, A fantastic problem. You must do a good job with lead generation. And what is your strategy around lead generation? When a new agent comes in, are you, are you feeding them leads? Are you purchasing leads? Are you teaching them how to organically lead generate all of the above? All of the above. Um, We have a pond of leads. So I've gone back and forth for my other CRM. I've gone back and forth between companies and I'm back to one. I'm back with Real Geeks. I was with Real Geeks and then I was with Boomtown because I had shiny penny syndrome. <laughs> and then I went back to um, Real Geeks, mm-hmm. you know, because of one of our coaches suggested it. And um, it's a whole lot cheaper and just easy peasy. Um Got where I was going with that, but talking about where your leads are coming from and how you're oh, so agents. we've got a pond of leads. So when if an agent were to come and go, or sometimes they say, Listen, I've got too many leads here, take them back. So we'll stick them in the pond and you can see if someone's active or not. And if if they're active, I mean, those are buyers who kind of are raising their hands. So, you know, that's great for a new agent to say, here, absolutely go take the ones that are raising their hand or looking. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to take you back to, you made a comment about buyers finding agents, finding listing opportunities through buyers. And you said, okay, I realized this was something that maybe like I missed with them was helping them convert. What's your advice that you give your team now? Or is there a training around this or how does that work? (sighs) You know, in a perfect world, I would, if you're thinking about getting into real estate, you've got the role play. I mean, that's just a given you have got to role play you've got to love to role play you you know you I would rather look stupid with uh you know another agent than look mm-hmm. stupid with a buyer or a seller yep. so <clears throat> anyway I, I love role play actually when I was at Keller Williams I was in top of their agent leadership council and that's one class I taught mm-hmm. there and I loved it. And I would sit there in the middle of the room and there'd be 20 or 30 in there, not just role play, just choosing each ones. And anyway, I'm surprised anybody showed up for that one, but um, you've got to role play and you can't just do it for two or three weeks. You need to do it long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Scripts and role play, I think are fundamental to any agent's Success and level of confidence as well, because when you know what to say and you have lots of choices about what to plug into a conversation, it makes all the difference. That's obvious. Such such good advice. So good, so fast. Yeah, yeah. All right, I do want to pivot to the investment. Now, you mentioned that. You you could go off on a whole other tangent on that, but talk to me about the how you got into investing and how that feeds your business, and you know what that that piece of the business looks like for you. In our area, um, and at that, my husband 
not at that time, my husband, but he would buy land mm -hmm. and he would, uh, the, um, this was before GISs, but he would go to a surveyor's office and look through the big book, you know, with all the surveys in it. And he would call people who had a lot of land and say, hey, you want to sell your land? Mm -hmm. um, so he had a little bit of success doing that because he had another job and whatnot, but we found this one particular piece and at that time I knew just enough to be dangerous and um, the county rules at that time were not as um, stringent as they are now but um, it was 136 acres and we took and cut it into five acre tracks it was a ton of road frontage mm. it was just perfect mm. um, and just divided it up. So we paid like 3,600 an acre for it and turn around at that time and maybe sold it for seven an acre. Wow. So, and then I was addicted after that. I mean, so, I mean, I would love, I need another piece right this minute, but our most recent sale, um, we bought 80 acres and kind of did little mini farms. We put in two mm -hmm. gravel roads and, um, the, by the time the engineering and all that got done, I figured, oh my gosh, we've missed the market. And, but we hit a sweet spot. And in like six months, we sold almost every lot but one. Wow. And at this point, we were getting 28,000 an acre. Wow. So, you know, it just kind of it was addictive. And then since we've also done a few flipper houses, um, I've had some sellers come in and say, listen, Mom's going in a nursing home and I'm going to have to pay the bill unless we sell mom's house. So can you just find me a buyer real quick? And I'm like, I'm your buyer. Yeah. And so I bought it, fixed it up and flipped it. Um, and now we're to the point where we've got a builder that I'll buy the land, chop it up and have lots. And then so the builder doesn't have to go get a loan. Mm -hmm. I'll own him the money at 10%. And he's happy to pay it because he didn't have to go through all the rig and roll, mm -hmm. you know, getting the mortgage. Mm -hmm. So I get my lot sold. I get my commission on the house and um, I'm making 10 percent on loaning money. Amazing. Very smart business plan. Really uh, interesting to hear how you you started it because it's, it's different than a lot of agents do where they're either starting with fix and flips or becoming yeah. landlords or building a multi units property of some kind it's really interesting the way that you that you did it that's yeah, really cool. it's yeah. um you know i'm up that at times i mean the most of it has been cash we paid cash i think only on one one right in 07 mm -hmm. um did we get a mortgage mm -hmm. for anything but we made it through the the crash at that time so mm -hmm. i don't know it's i'd like to do a lot more of it. I, I need to slow down selling real estate so I can do more of my own stuff. <laughs> That's the thing. When you have a team and we have a level of, of success that you have, it's hard to kind of push your, pull your foot off the gas pedal and pivot to something else. Let's revisit your team. We're coming up on, oh my gosh, we're actually over our normal time, but I always say this goes so fast, but I have so many things I want to ask you. So I will, I'll leave it at like one more thing maybe, which is I want to just go back to your current team. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis that you place on teamwork within your team. What is your, what's your um, philosophy around agents being part of a team and how your agents operate within your team specifically? Well, I mean, being that I, we don't have any inside sales associates. So my agents still, if they've got their bucket of um, people, you know, I expect them to keep up with their bucket of people. Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, get them under contract. If they get them under contract, then they can then hand it off to the closing coordinator and let mm -hmm. her help hold their hand. And, you know, they're still involved, but she's helping um, take some of the paperwork off of them so they can go out and, you know, sell more property. Um, Lots of support. But, and, you know, obviously then they go to closing. And then after that, it's their responsibility to love on that past client and, mm -hmm. you know, generate that into more business. And I would say right now, 45% of our business comes from past clients, repeat and referral. Oh, wow. And they're doing a good job loving on those past clients. Yeah. That's phenomenal. 
Now, is there, is there collaboration amongst the team members? Are they kind of doing their own thing? How does that work there? Um, well, we talk. I mean, in the past, we've used um, Skype, and then it got hinky, so we went to Teams, and then they wanted money. Then my new marketing guy um, suggested, and I've heard everybody like Slack, and I think yeah, paper Slack too. But he came up with one that's Discord. Oh, Discord, yeah, yeah. So he's like gamers use it, and I'm like, Great. yes. So I think that's the one that the little kid, you know, got um, that was posting stuff, the government secrets. He did it all through Discord. Oh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Discord is free. Yeah. Um, there's a paid version of it, but we talk through Discord. We've got Discord channels and, um, you know, obviously, you know, we've got agents coming into the office and team meetings and um, mm -hmm. lunch and learns and things like that. But, you know, we'll talk through Discord and, you know, just put it out there and other agents are following up. And so... It's great. Yeah. And that's a, another great little nugget for people listening is when, if you are starting a team or collaborating in any way, instead of texting, use something like Discord or Slack. Discord is a great suggestion if you want to go with something that's, you know, relatively low cost. And for people who are coming out of college or have been in gamers, like you said, you'll know Discord. Um, so it'll be very familiar to you, but it's a nice way of kind of encapsulating that thread of communication in its own little spot rather than intermingling it with all of the other things that you're doing and sometimes losing the threads. That's yeah. Good suggestion. All right, cool. What else would you like people to know about you or you have anything else that you'd like to put out there in terms of advice or insight from people? Well, for new agents, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm sure you've read, but I've got to find my copy of it. Fanatical Prospecting. Oh yeah. You've read that one. Yeah. I love that book. And God, there's another one. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, this one. Love this. Oh, book. that's a good one. Stop squatting with your spurs on. Yes, yes. That is so, so good. It is a good, that's a good eye opener kind of book. Yeah. So to go back to the disc. I mean, that's. Yep it made me feel so much better after I read it. I felt, I'm like, I thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> Until yeah. I read it and I'm like, there's nothing wrong with me. Right. Yeah. It's a good normalizer for those of us with a certain disc uh, makeup, but yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, Leanne, thank you so much for doing Absolutely. this. It's been a pleasure. How can people find you if they're interested in finding out about your team or working with you to buy or sell a home? Oh, expertrealestateteam.com. My cell phone is 864-380-5590. I wish I knew my Instagram handle and all that. It's <laughs> probably Leanne Carswell um, or at Leanne Carswell. Um, but you just text me. All right. So reach out, reach out to Leanne. She's got obviously a great team, great philosophy, and is, is here to answer questions that you have. Thank you for listening today. Uh, thank you, too, to our podcast sponsors who make this show possible. They are the Rozak team with Embrace Mortgage, Paul Harsani with First National Bank, Village Settlements, and Peak Settlements. Please consider supporting the professionals who support us, and please connect with us and Leanne on social media. Feel free to ask us questions and thank you. Thank you to all of you who have left us reviews, ratings, and sent us kind words. We love hearing from you and are so grateful. Thank you again. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time. We are so grateful you joined us today. If you've benefited from the advice we share on the show, we hope you'll tune in to our next episode. Interested in learning more about my personal mentoring programs, our career kickstart course, or to pick up a copy of my book, Farming for Real Estate Agents, your step-by-step -step guide for becoming the go-to agent in your local market, visit www.meredithfogel.com and click the resources tab. If you are curious about becoming part of the List Realty family of agents, go to the www.thelistrealty.com website and click Careers from the About Us page, or find me at the Meredith Global Team on social media. 
Thank you for listening. This has been So You Want to Be a Real Estate Agent. We'll see you next time.